There'd have to be some sort of global computing capacity with wireless links to every single person on Earth who keeps some kind of device on their person all the time. And obviously, this is impossible. This is from Norbert Weiner's 1950 book, The Human Use of Human Beings. It depicts a futuristic time and place where we're all connected, able to access any information at any time and communicate with those around the globe. Two wars, I have a dream, a man on the moon, and the birth of the internet later, we live in a world where Norbert's prediction is a reality. His warnings revolved around the idea that technology will have a significant impact on our social communication, a world where we're constantly consuming but not individually producing, ultimately succumbing to the seductive glow of a handheld device. So with the birth of modern VR, this principle finds itself alive yet again. So how do we fix it? What are the warnings? What are the solutions? Well, no one better than the father of virtual reality himself, Jaron Lanier, to show us. Do we? Born in 1960, and besides looking like a dungeon master that I would gladly trust to lead, Jerome is considered one of the key figures in the field of virtual reality. In fact, he's credited for coining the phrase virtual reality. Back in 1984, him and his friend Thomas Zimmerman founded one of the first VR companies, VPL Research. They actually developed and sold a haptic suit, gloves, and headset called the iPhone. And Jaron's view of VR is interesting. He sees it almost as a waking state of intentional dreaming, a dream machine, something extremely beautiful. So think of it like this. Way back when we began to write and transfer ideas via cave paintings, then symbols we call letters strung together to form sentences. What Jaron envisions is a time where we can use VR to create what we mean, what we feel, and communicate that to others as fast as we think it like a cuttlefish is able to dramatically change its color and shape to fit its feeling. VR can potentially allow us to reach a deeper, more focused and connected form of communication, what Jaron calls post-symbolic communication. Imagine as Jaron puts it, instead of saying, I'm hungry, you instinctively, after hours and hours of experience in the VR world, simulate your own transparency so your friends could see you're on an empty stomach. Without even thinking about it, you're displaying what you're feeling. In this new form of communication, would we say the same things? Like, what would our conversations look like? This is the level that Jaron thinks about technology on. But with innovation comes problems. His warning is that VR can end up falling into a negative timeline. First and foremost, advertising. Look at the top social media sites in our current day and age of 2018. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube are the current kings. Almost all of these make the majority of their revenue from advertisements. And who's to blame them? It's a profitable business model, but it, it, it's gotten out of hand. The wealth of personal information found on Facebook allows advertisers, including us, full disclosure, to cater ad campaigns specifically for each person. Essentially, you are the product. What you post is the commodity. Now, imagine a world where every inch of public space is littered with augmented reality holograms that guide you to purchase from here rather than here. This would only amplify negative emotions throughout the day, like who wants to see an obnoxious hologram for a lawyer's office as you're taking a walk in Central Park? Say you drop a rat in a box with a big red button. Every time she pushes the button, a piece of cheese is dispensed. Now say you change the button so that it only dispenses cheese occasionally. The rat will continue pushing the button, but at a higher intensity, compulsively almost. This occasional reward further increases the addiction of the button pressing. Jaron relates this experiment to our phones. We've all had that giddy feeling of seeing someone like your post or drop a comment with praise. It feels great. Your brain immediately releases dopamine in a quick hit that goes as quick as it came. One can imagine a not-so-distant future where, within a fully immersive world, think Ready Player One, this compulsive loop of occasional reward is ever amplified. Between overwhelming advertisements and technologically induced dopamine traps, Jaron paints a pretty depressing future when it comes to VR, but he also gives us hope. 
Back in the early days, he and many of his friends predicted that TV would ultimately succumb to the advertisement model. For example, low-cost TV in exchange for your time spent watching ads. And TV did follow them. Hi, Billy Mays here with- Until it didn't. Welcome to the golden age of television. Companies like Netflix and HBO saw TV and decided to disrupt it by saying, hey, come pay a low monthly fee, we'll cut the ads and give you the best content. They essentially cut out the BS and just gave us what we wanted, and it actually worked. Lanier sees this as a potential model for both social media and the future of VR, a world where users pay a low monthly fee or pay-as-you-go fee to access higher quality posts, feeds, and content while keeping your data secure. It's like, why would we expect uh, the government or the social media sites to protect our data if we're giving it to them for free? Another one of his solutions comes down to the creators. His argument is that we need to transcend the darkness with creativity. We must create a culture around technology that is designed to bring beauty. This, in turn, will cancel out the possible negative effects or thought machines from VR. We're seeing the birth of a technology that can literally hijack the senses. We're strapping a toaster to our heads and transporting to other worlds. There's a chance there to create infinitely beautiful experiences that bring joy to someone's day, if even for 20 minutes. And Jaron reminds us not to hate Facebook, not to hate Google, and, and not to hate Twitter. He doesn't think it's a matter of bad people in these companies doing bad things, but rather a globally tragic, astoundingly ridiculous mistake rather than a wave of evil. I don't believe our species can survive unless we fix this. We cannot have a society in which if two people wish to communicate, the only way that can happen is if it's financed by a third person who wishes to manipulate them. Mistakes are just that. Once we're awake to them, we can fix them.